I think we have heard enough about Israeli position. Uh, is there any other uh, person, any other student uh, volunteering to make any comment about the country that he or she is going to be represented, but your person views? Go ahead, <laughs> America. <laughs> Here is the United States taking the lead again. <laughs> yes. Uh, as a major country, first of all, I want to thank WikiLeaks to <laughs> prevent our prime prime security issues. And don't call the I think I, this is an irony. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. It's very irony. Uh, I can say that for our country, I think it's my personal view. First of all. <coughs> Uh, is Iran's position for nuclear ambition uh, is a problematic issue not only for the Middle East issue but for the world security mm -hmm. issue. And uh, for the second part, as a United States delegate, I can say that uh, we definitely uh, mentioned the importance of human rights, and uh, this is an issue for the Security Council, mm -hmm. not only for the Secretary General or the world issues. But first of all, Security Council must take into account that Iran's nuclear ambitions is very important for the world security. Yeah, it is a concern for the world. It's a uh, concern for the whole world. And um, you, you mentioned something about human rights yes. in between. So how do you relate this issue to uh, uh, human rights? Iran's nuclear ambitions for the uh, peaceful purposes is very important, mm -hmm. as it's mentioned. So do you mean that uh, if Iran uh, abuses its rights stemming from the MPT mm -hmm. and this will set a negative precedent, a bad precedent for other countries and there will be more restrictions on the um, intentions or, or, or on the attempts of other countries to acquire peaceful nuclear technology. So, well, um, concern for the world. Uh, security perspective, but also um, all, um, peaceful applications of nuclear energy. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it is difficult to say that uh, the, he, whoever wanted to benefit from nuclear technology had never been obstructed. There is this very typical case of Turkey, which again you can follow from my publications and it's available just back in 96, 97. Um, I wrote on why Turkey was not successful in bringing nuclear technology to, to the country. And that was mainly because, not only because Turkey didn't have any plans or didn't have any financial resources or this and that, but the main reason was the concerns about Turkey's potential um, ambitions or intentions and the fear of this you know, um, secret collaboration between Pakistan and Turkey. And the United States, based on some rumors, based on some uh, information that they seem to have a little bit aggravated, and based on the statements made or comments made by some people who were not necessarily in responsible positions when they made the, these statements, but those who were indeed in, uh, retired personnel from the military, from diplomacy, from state bureaucracy, or even politicians. So Turkey was uh, actually not allowed to acquire nuclear technology for peaceful applications for more than three decades, four decades, when I wrote that piece back in uh, 96, 97. Now it's already a healthy century. Well, finally, Turkey is uh, building its first nuclear power plant. Well, even the pro-nuclear people are uh, concerned whether this is the best way of bringing technology, nuclear technology to Turkey, because there is not going to be any difference whether uh, between uh, the, the Russian firm building this nuclear power plant in St. Petersburg or in Akkuy because it is going to be built and operated for a long time by the Russians. So, well, this is a whole different situation, but yet 
there are some countries like Turkey uh, who were uh, not wanted to have this nuclear capability because of what they could do uh, with that capability. And Iran was actually one of them. But Iran found a way, as we have seen here uh, over the past two weeks or so, how they you know, found a way to overcome all these obstacles, uh, you know, uh, you know, talking to other actors, you know, getting technology or uh, material or scientific knowledge from various sources, and more specifically from Russia. And of course, in the meantime, because of their commitment and well preparedness, they have uh, achieved you know, uh, to bring in themselves to this level that they are at this moment. That, but on the other hand, of course, the MPT allowed a number of states uh, to benefit from peaceful applications of nuclear energy. And now there is this um, increasing interest or uh, desire, especially in the uh, Middle Eastern countries, even in African countries, um, in bringing nuclear technology to their countries. For instance, uh, United Arab Emirates signed a, a deal with the South Korean firm, South Korea actually, um, something that will cost them some like $20 billion. It's a big project for nuclear reactors. It's a big plant. So the United Arab Emirates is going to benefit from nuclear technology. Well, this would be one of the last things uh, that would come to one's mind because uh, oil-rich as well as natural gas-rich countries, why would they need nuclear technology? Well, this is a question. This is not a question that ask. This is a question that many people ask when people try to find an answer. <coughs> of course, Qatar is planning to do the same. Um, other countries in the region, Saudi Arabia is planning to do the same. And some African countries are also planning to do the same. So therefore, my explanation, I mean, my answer to these questions, of course, I'm not in a position to give a definitive answer. I cannot say here is, this is the answer to the question. But this is one of the answers which I personally believe uh, is the case, of course, because it is my, my personal opinion. But there may be some people who would just challenge it, just or you may agree, disagree. But it is something that comes out of the um, necessity in the eyes of the ruling elite in these countries. We're not talking about typical democracies and well-established state structures and uh, certain nations. For instance, Qatar, if it has a population like a couple of millions, maybe one tenth or one fifteenth or maybe at most one, uh, five percent of its population is Qatari. The rest are coming from other parts, from uh, South Pacific, South Asia, and even Latin America who, who go there for working and to having a good life, which is good unless you are under the sun. It is a very hot country. I was there in uh, May this year. But, but the, the living standards actually are very high. So there is this search among the Qatar, Qatari ruling elite, the sheikh and Amir uh, and whoever other people are, actually as to how to respond to Iran's nuclear program. Because there is this growing concern, as I just said, and many times as well before, um, when they look at the map, they see nothing but Iran all around them. So Iran's nuclear weapons uh, or the capability to build nuclear weapons on a short notice is something that is like a nightmare for these small monarchies, or small, you know, sheikdoms or kingdoms or this and that. So, um, therefore, in, in order to uh, legitimize their you know, rule in the eyes of the people whom they rule there, they s must seem to be doing something. So, of course, neither Qatar nor United Arab Emirates nor Saudi Arabia, being the biggest and most powerful among the Gulf states, can't do anything that would definitely uh, provide enough uh, security assurances to their own people. 
they always are in need of alliances with other states and the United States being one of them and the most important one. And again, I'll repeat what I said uh, in the first hour. As we now understand from the WikiLeaks, the, the statements that have uh, leaked to the press, these uh, countries or the representatives of these countries are reportedly, we don't know whether these are reflecting the truth as a whole because these are the notes you know, that are or just uh, maybe memoranda written by some embassy people, by some, uh, I don't know, those uh, who take notes, and they may make mistakes. There's always this margin of caution and we're not in a position to make any statements, uh, definitive statements about these things. But that said, we, we understand that they have real concern about Iran's nuclear program. So, of course, I, I, don't have, I didn't have enough time to study these countries in their, in their public domains. I've been there only on two or three occasions for a few days, like three or four days. Of course, I try to benefit from my being there in terms of making observations, talking to people, and to get an opinion as to how uh, they think about the situation there. This is not, you know, this is an academic curiosity. So, what I understand is that the ruling elite in the Gulf area are really concerned about this situation and in order to feel like they are doing, they are fulfilling their responsibilities toward their people, they must do something. So since they cannot do anything militarily, there is this Gulf Cooperation Council, but it doesn't have any military arm. So it doesn't have military you know, branch or there are no contingencies that the Gulf country, Gulf Cooperation Council, GCC, would have anything they don't have anything military. It's just you know um, an organization of uh, Gulf countries in order to have a to commensurate some of their foreign policy objectives. In this and it's not a big deal. It's not a political actor or, not, or a military actor. It, it, it cannot constitute something like a pact, something like uh, uh, you know uh, a military organization that would stand firm against Iran. This this is just not the case at all. So in the absence of anything that they could do in the mutual domain by themselves, they can do two things. Uh, first, of course, what is first and foremost for these ruling elites in the area is to survive, is, to, is the continuation of their rule. So for the Saudi Arabian king, for the Qatari emir, or uh, UAE's, you know, five emirates, uh, or seven, I forgot, um, anyway, so therefore, the first and foremost concern is continuation of their rule. So they can do this only uh, in, in two ways. One, of course, is to create or establish alliances with other powers, uh, the United States being the most important one, and they have done so already. And we have seen during the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, 1991, that you know, United States and the coalition forces have used their territories uh, to, for deploying large number of troops, hundreds of thousands of troops, because at one point the total number of troops accumulated in the Qatari, in the Saudi Arabian and Bahraini territories uh, exceeded 600,000 troops, most of them from the United States and UK, etc., etc. So, well, according to some, this has given. Uh, uh, the way to the emergence and, uh, and evolution of the um, Osama bin Laden's movement because he based his movement against the presence of the infidel, the infidel being the non-Muslims coming from other states, you know, putting their feet on the uh, sacred holy territory, Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. So this, had, this is something that had its own uh, separate uh, dimension. So the first thing, or the one thing that they can do is to establish, co form co uh, coalitions, alliance with the big powers, the United States. And the second thing is to, in a sense, take such actions that would um, put pressure, if any, uh, to opposition movement. Of course, it is very hard to speak of opposition in these you know, Gulf Emirates or kingdoms or Monarchies as a whole. And monarchy is not a term that our 
friends from the Gulf like, I know, but this is how people from outside perceive them. Just to, you know, for ease of uh, use, for facility of use, I'm using that term. So, and uh, there is not much opposition that we can think of, or, the, you know, or the opposition in the sense that we know, which would just, you know, uh, mobilize large number of people and just, you know, revolting against the established kingdom, shake them, emirate, etc. But at least, if, even if it is not the case today, there is also a certain degree of, um, you know, uh, unease or uh, this, uh, discontent, discomfort in the public domain as to what our king or emir or the sheikh uh, doing against this. So other than the military alliance with the big powers, the other thing would be to seem to be doing something that would at least give an image or create a perception in the public domain that they are going to level or balance the Iranian nuclear program. So, of course, nuclear reactors do not produce bombs. You do not just put fuel from one end, you get the bomb from the other end. There is no such thing. It is just, you know, uh, more than absurd. But nuclear programs, nuclear reactors that are for energy generation, electricity generation, or isotope uh, production for uh, curing uh, some illnesses, etc., or for uh, fertilizers, for agriculture, these are all um, installations that are needed for peaceful applications. But the very same peaceful applications can be used in such a way to constitute the basics the fundamental, the essence of a military program, if and when there is one such an ambition. So, for instance, uh, the fuel in the uh, nuclear reactor which generates electricity, when it becomes a waste, as we mentioned here, there is plutonium in it. If you can extract plutonium, you can use in your weapons. Or you can use this uh, nuclear program for covering or for, for uh, you know, preventing the, the rest of the world from seeing what is behind actually going on. Or at least the public domain, without having much knowledge about the specifics, about the technical details of a nuclear program, once there is one introduced in the country, people in the public domain, I mean, the, the, the population will think, wow, we are going nuclear too. We, we are going to build our own weapon. Well, of course, it's not going to be said probably loudly, but it's something that will provide uh, a certain degree of, uh, I don't know, um, uh, or create an impression in the public domain that the, the, the administration is doing something. I read the very same, or if not the same, similar remarks uh, in, in, on the website of uh, some uh, daily papers when there's a new news about you know, uh, the, you know, the Acqu nuclear power plant that is going to be uh, built by the Russian firm, there are tens of comments com coming from the readers. They say, now we are going to have our nuclear program, we are going to have our nuclear power or nuclear weapon, as if these you know, facilities, which are purely for peaceful applications, will, be, will themselves produce nuclear weapons. There is this misperception. So, therefore, uh, based on this, yeah, the uh, United States is definitely underlining or emphasizing that it is a, uh, a problem that the whole world should be concerned about. Secondly, it is something that might undermine uh, countries' uh, acquisition of peaceful nuclear technology if Iran abuses or exploits its uh, you know, privileges uh, for malign purposes. So, therefore, uh, in order to offset this uh, uh, view, actually, which somehow was predominant at some point, these countries in the Gulf have embarked upon uh, billions of dollars worth nuclear programs. And as I said, United Arab Emirates signed just about this time uh, last year or maybe early January this year um, a deal with South Korea, it's $20 billion. And actually what I said, my comment, Anyone might contend this comment. Of course, uh, I don't have any defi definitive sort of uh, uh, position here. 
my comment is that you know, our Emirates bought a certain degree of legitimacy for its own ruling elite uh, uh, with this image created in the eyes of its own population. So this is something, therefore, must be also seen from this perspective. Otherwise, it really doesn't make too much a sense, at least for this time being. We, we don't know much about what's going to be the, the future of uh, energy. I mean, there are all these conflicting reports about there are so many years left, uh, reserves uh, left in, in the world, like 20, 20 years, 30 years, et cetera, et cetera. No one is in a position to give a, a very uh, solid answer as to for how many years the existing oil reserves or natural gas reserves will be sufficient to provide enough energy wherever this energy is needed. So one explanation for the Gulf states to embark on a nuclear program might be to have cleaner energy uh, and, and to conserve some of their oil and gas and, and you know, substitute some of their uh, needs with the you know, nuclear energy. Fine, I can buy that. But when looked from a different perspective from, uh, or from uh, uh, someone who studies nuclear proliferation and security issues, of course, I always put a question mark at the end of these explanations that these are only for energy conservation re uh, reasons and also for having cleaner energy. Well, these are definitely real concerns that exist in these countries but may not be the most important reason as to why they spend 20 or so billion dollars for uh, you know, uh, acquiring nuclear technology transfer. Ibrahim, you had a question? Uh, I think the kids later, uh, the oil reserve that these countries have will not exist. And besides the military purposes, we can you say that they uh, prepare themselves for the future in economic and energy area? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, as I was just saying, there are all these conflicting reports about uh, how much oil reserves or, or natural gas reserves are left. We don't know. I mean, because some say, uh, well, maybe 20, 30 more years. Some others say there are still unexplored areas and there are some indications that are very promising that more than a couple of hundred years we may still have more than necessary oil and gas. And when I discussed this issue with my good friend Nejit Pamir, who is one of the most important energy uh, experts in the world, not only in Turkey, and whose idea and opinion actually mean a lot to me. And he actually is not in a position to also give a definitive answer. He says, it is not possible to say anything like this, like there are only 20 more years, uh, you know, stocks left, or 30 years or 50 years. Because even in Iraq, in the El Ambar area, which is pretty much the middle uh, or west, uh, part of the country. I mean, there are more than 10 times more oil reserves that they had anticipated before. So, and it's very close to the surface and the uh, cost of it is much, much less. And for instance, today, nowadays, uh, the barrel uh, of oil is like $80 something and the cost of exploring this, uh, extracting this, is less than a, a dollar. So you make, of course, there are some intermediate stages and, and people who benefit from this and get their share, but you make 80 times more benefit profit well, than when compared to the cost, the cost incurred, I mean, in, in extraction of this oil. Also in Siberia, also in Central Asia, also in the Caspian area, also in the United States. I mean, we always hear these rumors about the United States finding oil and just you know, tap, you know, putting a cap for further use when the rest. And some people even started making comments that in, in the moon there are certain energy resources. So I don't know. I mean, it will be far too realistic to, um, come to make such a comment. Like, because in, say, 20, 30 years' time, there will be no oil in the Gulf, and therefore now it is wise for them to invest. Well, that sounds pretty much fabricated, very artificial and uh, argument to me. Well, you, you agree, disagree, it's 
uh, it's all open to uh, speculation. All right, so taking advantage of this U.S. intervention, I just wanted to give you some sort of a, a perspective from the Gulf, which we have not covered at this with respect to this issue. All right, uh, anything else with respect to the United States? Uh, maybe last point, I can mention that the importance of IAEA report mm -hmm. is uh, it's a concern for the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, for the issue. Well, so, is the U.S. happy with the reports or? Uh, uh, they can't be. Ten percent of shoes that the report is true, of course. The uh, importance of Iran's nuclear ambitions mm -hmm. must be uh, taken into account for a new report, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, U.S. wanted that. Yeah, the United States, of course, uh, always emphasizes the role of the IAEA, which is something. Something I also emphasize on a number of occasions here. The role of the IAEA is something that I might very well ask in the final exam. So I would like you to study it. It's important because, because of what? Let me ask you. Why do you think, uh, Bushra, the IAEA's role is important in this picture? If you don't have any answer, I can ask anybody else. Okay, Amelia? Um, I think it's important because... <coughs> I can't hear you well. Please speak up. I think it's important because it can uh, conduct the protocols to see which states have mm -hmm. the nuclear weapons and to follow through and follow up on the states that have it and to make sure and enforce the rules that they sign up, that they agree. Yeah, I mean, uh, and there are certain problems associated with the IAEA implementing its role or just you know uh, executing its role, and I don't think the United States is 100% happy with the role the, the IAEA is you know playing here, because the United States, of course, now it's lowered the tone of its criticism with respect to the IAEA so far, or at least until say two, three years ago, the United States was if not directly making these accusations, but was criticizing the International Atomic Energy Agency for not um, emphasizing certain things as much as they would like to, to be emphasized. Because um, the United States, uh, the US administration, anybody actually, knowing the, the weight of the agency in world politics. Well, it's a technical body. It is established in 1957 to provide guidance, uh, assistance uh, to states that would you know, develop nuclear technology in order, to, in order to do things right, correctly, not only politically and more specifically technologically, scientifically, etc. So it is not a political body and it should not be politicized. And what I have seen so far, with maybe minor exceptions, the IAEA uh, authorities have refrained from making such political statements or such statements that would have political implications beyond their purpose. Of course, once pushed into the center stage of politics, you have to say something because people are not necessarily expecting some technical explanations which may not mean too much. Even if the uh, knowledgeable people might just read uh, this kind of explanation, they may not understand what the situation is. The IAEA is in a position to make, if of course provided that they are given this authority or the, the, this you know, uh, permission to do so, they are in a position to say definitively, almost 100, with 100% 100 precision, whether there is anything wrong with the nuclear program of a country, not only Iran, but any country, or everything is fine. So for the, for the IAEA to be able to say this, it must be empowered with the powers conferred upon the agency by the additional protocol. But the additional protocol is enforced only for those who have signed and ratified them, Iran not being one of them. Iran signed but not ratified, and is not going to be uh, one of them. It's not likely to ratify in, in the foreseeable future if there is no resolution in the conflict between P5 plus 1 plus 1 and Iran. So 
Therefore, the IAEA has the power, the capability, the ability, the technical skills, and also the prestige that is necessary for making a conclusive, definitive uh, statement that a country is not doing something wrong or it is uh, doing something wrong. But in the case of Iran, it is not in this position. And what the United States asked or expected from the IAEA because of its importance or its significance in the eyes of world community. And they believe, the United States believe, if the IAEA blamed Iran for doing things wrong, that would you know, provide uh, uh, a lot of uh, support to the US and Israeli positions. But the IAEA refrained from, from you know, crossing the threshold, going beyond its mandate. And so far, as I have seen throughout the uh, you know, uh, past two decades uh, implementation of the IAEA inspections, reports, and everything, they try to be at the very uh, border of uh, you know, falling in, in, in on either side. Because if they say something that, can, that could not be fully technically, scientifically substantiated, they will definitely lose the, the the confidence that the world, actually, the communities, states, everybody uh, have about the IAEA. But if, if they do not make some statements because of some political concerns, they will not have fulfilled their mandate. Remember, the task of the IAEA is the timely detection of diversion of significant quantity of fissile material from peaceful to military applications. For the IAEA to fulfill the mandate within this MPT framework, they have to be able to be up to the task at all times. They should not be obstructed from having access to technical findings, scientific findings, or data. Or they want to talk to Iranian people, they are not allowed to do so. They want to go to some facilities, they are not allowed to do so. They want to carry out some inspection in some you know, territories, they are not allowed to do so. Well, can we blame Iran for not allowing in one sense, no, because they are uh, subject to the modern protocol, the older one, the 1971 uh, protocol, IMSERC 153. But on the other hand, we can blame because if a country doesn't have anything to hide, and if they have confidence uh, on their own program, if that they, they definitely are telling the truth, there should be nothing to hide, and therefore they should allow such an international agency, which has not been corrupt, at least, and which is not only because they won the Nobel Prize, uh, together with the uh, Director General al Barde, but actually this agency cannot be blamed for being corrupt. I mean, you can say anything about the IAEA, but you cannot just say the IAEA has been the tool of the, 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 the powerful against the weak. No. The IAEA has always tried to maintain a certain balance between its technical mandate as well as the political expectations or the expectations of the politicians from them. So it's a very hard uh, thing to do. It's, a, it's like a, walking on, on a very tight rope. It's, it's something that every single step you make, you have to pay attention. So the IAEA, therefore, could not satisfy the United States. But as I said um, also in the previous weeks, they could not satisfy the uh, Iranians either. So that's a good sign. If, you, if, the international, if an agency which is seen, even if it is not, uh, it, or it doesn't have such a role, if it is seen as brokering uh, a deal between two actors, and if that actor is not satisfying the expectations of either side, well, in some respects, that might be a negative thing, that, that might be a bad thing, because it might um, display its incompetence that it cannot do anything. But on the other hand, depending on the context, and especially in this context, Iran is not satisfied with the IAEA, and the United States is not satisfied either with the IAEA. That's, in, in my perspective, a good sign. Because um, neither the uh, Iranians nor the Americans have uh, been successful in manipulating the agency for their own purposes and the IAEA has done the right thing. And so far, they said, we are not in a position to make a definitive statement that Iran is uh, you know, building a weapon, 
but we cannot also be, we cannot provide enough assurances that they are not doing. So therefore there are certain gaps in the uh, in information that they need in, in order to give a definitive answer. So the role of the IAEA, if it is a uh, concern for the whole world, must be further emphasized, of course, not only by uh, giving up ambitions to manipulate this agency by big powers like the United States, but also Iran must also uh, allow this agency to uh, carry out its inspections. All right, so far with the U.S., and let's use our last like uh, 10 or so minutes with a different country perspective, such as uh, which one? Is there any Syrian, quote unquote, here? Go ahead, Dollar. What is the Syrian position? I mean, or your own personal thoughts based on what you have learned about the Syrian position. You don't have to uh, give a Syrian perspective if you don't want to, but just anything that, based on your research and communication with the Syrian authorities so far, how is this situation being um, interpreted by the Syrians or in Syria? A little bit loudly. Start with the uh, Syrian perspective since my uh, personal view uh, uh, differentiates from. Yeah, okay. Uh, now you're going to give a Syrian perspective. Yes, okay, yes. go ahead. Uh, first, Syria is a significant country to the uh, non proliferation treaty since the uh, 1980s. And Syria wants to see uh, a void of. Can you speak up a little bit? The void of weapons of mass destruction in the region and its position uh, towards this technology has always been uh, weak with its dependency, which is medical treatment. And Syria definitely believes that every uh, country has a right to uh, possess nuclear uh, peaceful energy and this is really uh, granted. Uh, by the international agreements. And so, if you have to talk about permanent peace in the region, Israel uh, has been the one complicated issue. Uh, so, their stance towards uh, non proliferation treaty, uh, they uh, learned this in Gaza and in Mali, Mali, for instance. Uh, they have disrupted the peace in the region. Mm -hmm. And besides, Syria strongly believes that Israel has this weapon. Mm -hmm. So uh, Syria thinks that Israel will be proliferated in the region and in the world. And as I said before, uh, Syria is always against uh, any country to possess uh, such weapons. So uh, with that said, uh, since this uh, is keeping the world's worst state secret, uh, Iran also has a right to possess uh, such a known to the country of the US. So, does Syria acknowledge uh, the right of Iran to have nuclear weapons? Is this what you say? Yes. Um, well, I don't think that would be meaningful under the MPT because. Um, Syria, I mean, it, uh, this could be a view of a Syrian authority, a personal opinion, but I don't know if it could be the official position of Syria, because the MPT that Syria has also signed and ratified, and Syria is a state party to the MPT, as a non-nuclear weapon state, Syria cannot acknowledge the right of any other country, let alone Iran, which is its own very close ally in the region, any other country to have nuclear weapons to, or to pursue nuclear weapons ambitions. I think there must be something that needs to be corrected in your conversation with the Syrians. Or maybe you should warn them that they should read if um, this is the view coming yeah, from the Syrian authorities. The first said uh, they strongly against uh, uh, nuclear weapons, perfect. Uh, but if it, it is Iran, they are not against, is it what, yeah, what they say? And they, afterwards they said if uh, Israel is uh, possessing such weapons and hence uh, possessing such strength to the region. Uh, Iran has also had a right to uh, uh, pro, pro, um, uh, 
advance such nuclear program so as they do? Again, I repeat, I think if this is the official position of the Syrian diplomats that you had a chance to talk to, either you or he should or she should check, the, because it is not possible, I mean, f formally speaking, I mean, uh, from leg legalistic point of view, I think Azam is going to add something. I will add something. Yes. Uh, we have told the uh, master and he uh, told us that uh, uh, Iran, we do not support Iran in Iran's nuclear, and nuclear program, but we also do not support Israel or any other Yeah, that's country. a different thing. And who can guarantee that Israel would not use the nuclear, uh, no, th that's a whole different issue. What, what I'm saying is no member of the MPT, be it a nuclear weapon state or non-nuclear weapon state, can uh, make such statements in a formal conversation or in a formal statement uh, uh, acknowledging that a country has the right to go nuclear, I mean develop nuclear weapons. This is not possible from legalistic point of view, from even diplomatic point of view. But what if they said something like, well, in view of the threat posed by uh, the Israeli nuclear weapons capability, never acknowledged but never denied, but we believe that they exist, we, uh, we understand Iran's ambitions to take such measures to protect itself, blah, blah, in, a, in an oblique way, in, a, in, a, in an ambiguous way, he or she can make such a statement. But when it comes to acknowledging Iran's right to develop nuclear weapons, this is something that must be really uh, corrected. This is not possible. So therefore, uh, I mean, no official statement can be in, in, in that format from any country. Well, uh, Israel, Pakistan, India, and North Korea, these are now the only four states who are staying out of the MPT, and all others are members of the MPT. And no member of the MPT can make such a statement. But as I said, the Syrians may have a certain degree of sympathy with Iran's uh, nuclear program, not nuclear weapons program, but advancing their nuclear capabilities doesn't necessarily mean that they are advancing for military purposes. Because as you know, Israel uh, hit a, a, a nuclear facility in the Syrian territory, which is Al-Kibar, <laughs> means <laughs> Kibaro. <laughs> we have nothing to do with it. We have no shares, no, no secret connection, nothing. But this Al-Kibar reactor was hit by these Israeli uh, jet fighters in 2007, September, or 2007, right? The time is passing so fast. Well, so, and this reactor was just destroyed. There is no such, but what we, what I read from different sources that Syrians are trying to rebuild the reactor or just build a similar reactor which is different. What was significant with respect to this reactor, by the way, as a parenthesis, as a footnote, was the, that was almost the exact same replica of the Yongbyon reactor the North Koreans built, operated, and extracted enough plutonium from its waste. And the plutonium was used in the nuclear test that North Korea conducted in 2006 and 2008. So the al kibar reactor, if and when finished, based on the uh, statements made by American and Israeli scholars, experts, it, it, it could produce enough plutonium for, Israel, for Syria to extract you know, and to use in its nuclear program. Well, these are all statements made by Israelis and Americans, of course, in order to serve their own purpose. But uh, the Syrian position, of course, uh, must be seen from a wider angle. And Syria is maybe, if not the only, but the most important ally of Iran in the region and in the world. Yes, Iran has many friends in the world, supported uh, by a number of countries. Not so many, and we have seen actually in the voting of the UN Security Council membership as non-permanent members, and Iran was one of the least, uh, one of the countries which had received least support. But still, for a country which has been presented to the world as uh, being the sponsor of terrorism, as which has been isolated, 
uh, which has its own self-imposed restraints, constraints in entering into relations with other countries, still uh, uh, it was a good a deal of number, a uh, deal of countries. But Syria, being one of the most important uh, countries from the Ir Iranian perspective, and vice versa, I think the position of uh, Syria vis-a-vis -vis Iran's nuclear program cannot be uh, a negative one. They definitely expect something that I said last Friday, that Iran wants to be the nuclear supplier or the supplier of nuclear technology to the third world countries, the non-aligned non movement countries, Islamic countries, and also countries in, in its uh, uh, region, in the Middle East. So Syria might have some expectations because of having a common denominator against Iran, because Syria has lost Egypt after Egypt, you know, uh, after the Yom Kippur War, you know, the whole process and the Camp David peace process, you know, Sadat going to Israel, and this uh, Israeli-Egyptian peace deal, etc. So Syria, in order to feel more confident uh, and to have this alliance uh, relationship, favors Iran's position. Uh, and wants Iran to remain as a powerful actor in the region, which may back, it, uh, back, uh, back up Syria in its uh, uh, policy. So, therefore, Syria may not have a negative view of Iran's into program, but whatever view they may have, they, may, they can never make such explicit official statements that they are acknowledging the right of Iran to build nuclear weapons. Anyway, um, so far and so long with Iran's nuclear program, so in the next two weeks, I mean, in uh, two weeks' time that you have, please get together with your uh, teammates, revise the uh, statements that you have prepared, the uh, things that you are going to say in the simulation, and if there's anything that you would like to consult with me, just either drop by anytime you like or just uh, send an email, make an appointment. But beyond this, I will send... Um, via email several readings with respect to terrorism issue and we will uh, you know, use our remaining four class hours, I mean one hour on Friday, two hours next Tuesday and one hour next Friday, we will devote our time to studying terrorism and seeing its implications for the world and for the region. So check your emails and whenever you get these attachments, please have them printed or read from the screen but come to class having read and uh, make some comments and participate. All right, see you next uh, Friday.